So this morning we are continuing our New Year's kind of mini sermon series we're doing right now, uh, where we're talking about three really simple, not necessarily easy, but simple uh, changes you can make right now at the start of 2018 to make sure 2018 will end up being the best year of your life so far in terms of your relationship with God, um, which in turn will make it hopefully the best year of your life overall so far anyway. Because if you don't know, life basically operates on this, this axis of sorts, right? Where if your relationship with God is just a little bit off, everything else in your life is going to be off too. From finances, to parenting, to marriage, to career, to your health, everything is directly connected to what you do in terms of your relationship with God. So if that's off a little bit, everything else will be off. But get that relationship with God on track, and everything else just seems to fall into place as you give Him control of it too. It's just so amazing how it happens. And so we're talking about three simple changes you can do right now to make sure you go from this to that and stay there for the rest of this year. Like last time we met, we talked about uh, what the Apostle Peter says in his uh, second letter that you find in the New Testament, where he basically says, okay, understand, if you've put your trust in Jesus to save you, understand what you have at your disposal. You have the power of God available to help you with whatever changes you need to make in your life. You need more love in your heart. You need more self-control in some area. You need more goodness, more perseverance. Understand, God's power is available to help you with that. It's actually in Greek, it's this word that we get our word dynamite from. God's dynamite supernatural power is available to you. Your job is just to use that power and to make every effort toward those things. It's not automatic. It's not just, oh God, give me patience, and then boom, you have patience. No, you got to work toward patience. But as you do, as a follower of Christ, God goes, I got your back. My power will be there to help you with those things and those changes he wants you to make to be more the person he created you to be. If you missed that sermon, it's online. Please be sure to catch it. Um, and please be sure not to miss what we're talking about today, which is to resolve to go all in with Jesus. And we'll explain what that means in a second, but that's your first fill in there. Resolve to be all in with Jesus this year, which believe it or not, may not look all that different from eating at your favorite restaurant. What? Seriously. By the way, what were some of your favorite restaurants? What did you say, Michael? Olive Garden. Olive Garden? Oh, I used to, man. When we lived in Roseville, there was a really good one around the corner from us. What else? What else? Scott, what's your favorite restaurant? A favorite restaurant? Um, it's okay, even if it's like some really place that's bad for your teeth. It's okay. <laughs> well, actually, uh, lately, it's uh, that teriyaki wetness has opened up. Really oh, hard. yeah. I love how, did you, did you all notice, by the way, at the little Imogen uh, shopping center, every food place has some like extreme main name, like it's teriyaki madness, it's smash burger. It's all, you have to be very violent to have a food place there, apparently. Okay, let's do one more. Vaughn, what's your favorite food place? Or a favorite uh, food place? Tony's uh, Napolitana. Oh, where is that one? That's in San Francisco. It's uh, Italian um, pizzeria. Cool, very cool. Speaking of Italian, my personal favorite on this entire planet is this little family-owned place called Strizzy's in Pleasanton, where Amy and I used to live. And um, I just, I have never had food like this in my life. It, it's like they take your order and walk behind the wall, and they must have an escalator to heaven where they get the food. I, I have never had food like that anywhere on this planet in my life. And if you don't know, today is actually my wife and my our 12 year anniversary, and you better believe we plan to go there for dinner. Uh, so it's an amazing place. And it's not just the food, though, too. It's such a great atmosphere. And some of your restaurants that you like might be the same thing. It just has this great feel when you're inside there. It's cheerful, it's clean. I mean, that's important. You don't want cockroaches crawling across your table, right? And uh, most importantly, perhaps, the food is like hot when it's supposed to be, right? And cold when it's supposed to be. You ever been to a restaurant where it's not on your favorite list because? Food that was supposed to be hot was not. Eh, it's kind of gross, right? And you're eating nachos at a certain restaurant. One day, I'll tell you that story later if you want to hear. And it's like, dude, nachos are supposed to be hot, and these are lukewarm, and I'm kind of getting grossed out here. How long were these sitting here? Yeah, food's supposed to be hot if it's supposed to be hot and cold if it's supposed to be cold. And that's a mark of a good restaurant, right? Um, it's actually a mark of food safety, too. Anyone ever work in, like, catering or, or you know, waitressing? Right? Yeah, good. Okay. You know, they make you watch this video, right, that I had to watch back when I worked in, in catering briefly. And um, it's this video for food safety. And one thing I learned I didn't know was that specific temperature range that food has to be in um, to stay safe. There's a range where it becomes unsafe. You all know this? Like hot foods are supposed to stay above 140 degrees and cold foods are supposed to stay below 40 degrees. And the reason for that is that that little window in between 40 to 140 is where bacteria actually multiplies the fastest. And uh, 
can make you very, very sick. That kind of lukewarm range is actually called the food danger zone in terms of safety. And it's not something to mess around with unless you want to make people sick and never have them come back to your restaurant or your home again, right? So you wanna keep hot foods hot, like keep the fire going, keep cold foods cold, because lukewarm equals major issues and major sickness and a lot of problems. And believe it or not, that's exactly what Jesus has to say in Revelation 3, except on a spiritual level. He says the same principle, actually, that we just talked about in food safety in a good restaurant also applies to your relationship with God. Because um, when it comes to a relationship with God, you want one that some, some people would call on fire, right? In turn, it, it's passionate. It's all, you're all in. I'm excited about this. I'm faithfully following him. I'm fully alive is the idea. And falling into anything less than that, any kind of half-hearted commitment to Jesus, any kind of lukewarm relationship, as Jesus will call it, that has a danger zone, too, in terms of spiritual things. And the consequences there are a lot more serious than food consequences. And that's exactly why Jesus says what he does here in what we're about to read. Where we'll pick up the story, it's around 90 AD, and um, it's well after Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave, and in the opening chapters of Revelation here, the resurrected Jesus is actually dictating some letters to one of his followers to write to some churches that this guy had started. He's talking to his follower named John, and um, he tells John, hey, I want you to write down, take notes on these letters I'm gonna dictate, and then send these out to these seven churches. Now, what were these seven churches? Well, here's a map. They were located in what today is Turkey. And they were all churches that history tells us the Apostle John actually had started. And Jesus says, hey, write these letters to these churches. Some of them, he's like, you're doing awesome. You just need to tweak this. Some of them, he's like, you're doing terrible. You need to fix this. And um, the church we're going to read today, this letter, was a church in a city called Laodicea which is extra cool, if you ask me, because Laodicea is a lot like the culture you and I live in every day. Check this out. In Laodicea, it was a place that was very wealthy compared to the rest of the area, right? America is pretty wealthy compared to the rest of the world. In fact, Laodicea was the richest city in its area during this time in history. And as a result, they were very self-sufficient in terms of needs. They didn't go to other places to ask for help when major tragedies struck. Hmm. Kind of like America, right? It was also a city that was located on one of the greatest Asian trade routes of that time. And so it was a leading center for banking and financial stuff. Um, it had a lot of commercial prosperity, too. They had these famous products that the entire world looked to them and said, we want what you have. Sounds like America a lot of times, right? Um, in their case, they had this black wool that people would make carpets and, and clothes out of. And um, Laodicea also had this famous eye salve. This is like medical ointment for your eyes. Uh, which was appropriate because Laodicea was a huge hub for medicine. They had a medical school there, and the whole world looked at them, oh, this is where to go if you want to learn about medicine, and they have the good medical stuff. Even the church in Laodicea was a little extra important. It was actually the head of those seven churches that were on that map um, that Jesus was writing to. So I just look at that and I go, man, if Laodicea was that similar to where I live today, I should probably pay a little extra attention to what Jesus says to them because he might be saying the same thing to me and us in our culture. And especially since, sadly, the church in America a lot of times looks like the church he's writing to in terms of being lukewarm spiritually. It's all too easy for us to fall into that. So let's see what Jesus has to say about that here and what to do about it and what we can apply for our own lives here as a result. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Revelation 3, starting in 14, check it out. It says this. Jesus says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I don't need a thing. But you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Notice how he goes after all the stuff they were known for. We'll come back to that. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we'll stop there. All right, so first off, 
Who is this letter from? Well, Jesus lets his church know, hey, what you're about to read in this letter, this isn't just some random guy's opinion, right? This isn't just another letter from just another guy. No, he says, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. In other words, understand what you're about to read. These are the words of the Son of God, okay, who faithfully told people about God during his earthly ministry, the faithful and true witness, right? Who continues to be that faithful witness to this day. The son of God who wants his church to follow his example of faithfulness and that witness by telling people about him and how they can have eternal life through Jesus. And uh, they're the words, he says, of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. The point being, listen up. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to say next. I mean, if you got a letter from Jesus himself, an email, a text on your phone, doo -doo -doo, message from the Son of God, you know, I hope you would take it seriously, assuming you knew it was actually from him and not a prank. If you knew it was really him, man. So then he says to this church, I know your deeds, <laughs> which in this church's case was not a positive for them, right? Not something to be proud of. Um, because as he goes on to say there, their Christianity was lukewarm. In other words, they were living a half-hearted version of Christianity, this kind of passionless, compromised Christianity. They were calling themselves a church, calling themselves Christians and followers of Christ, but they weren't really following him. They weren't really doing what he called them to do. You know, they, were following, they weren't following his example of that faithfulness, of that being effective in their faith. They were actually being ineffective in their faith. Sounds like some churches we know today, doesn't it? Sadly. They call themselves Christian, they don't actually live like Jesus, and it has a negative ineffectiveness on the culture around them. As Jesus says, they were neither cold nor hot. Which, by the way, that statement would have really resonated with them, because in the city of Laodicea, even though they had so much, they didn't have hot water. Anyone ever have your water heater go out temporarily, and it's like, ugh, lukewarm at best? It's just, it's like the worst day of your life, and you forget, wow, other people in other countries never have hot water. But man, Laodicea, no hot water. Now, there was a place nearby called Hierapolis that had these thermal springs. And so they would say, oh, we can get hot water from them. They'd try to pump it in from Hierapolis, but at best, by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. They never got hot water. So it was probably constantly frustrating to Laodicea, maybe even disgusting. I mean, you ever try to drink, like, lukewarm coffee? Yay. You know, it's gross. So Jesus uses that to make a pretty strong point here, right? He goes, okay, you know how this lukewarm water you deal with grosses you out and annoys you? <laughs> well, get this, the way your lukewarm Christianity is, is here, that's making me sick. As he says, I wish you were either one or the other, hot or cold. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. It cracks me up in America how sometimes we translate the Bible kind of nice. Because uh, if you read the Bible in the original languages, it's, it's not always as nice and family-friendly as we translate it we, in English. And um, this is one spot where, in English, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Okay, if you read it in Greek, you know what he actually says? He actually, it's actually the word for vomit. Jesus is literally saying, the way your church is acting makes me want to puke. <laughs> That's literally what this says in Greek. Um, so Jesus is more literally telling them, dude, you're, you're making me sick. I want to vomit over the way you guys are behaving. Which, you might go, man, I, I picture Jesus as like the guy on a Hallmark card petting sheep, and he'd never say something like this. Well, this is the Jesus that's in the Bible. He's really serious about this, in case you haven't noticed. And um, as rough as it would have been to hear that from Jesus, how many of you know sometimes what you need to hear is not always what you want to hear, right? Anyone with parents knows that, right? <laughs> Trying to tell your kids. Sometimes what you need to hear isn't what you want to hear. And that was the case for these guys. They probably didn't want to hear Jesus say, your church makes me want to puke. But they needed to hear it because from their perspective, nothing was even wrong. They were living lukewarm, being ineffective. And check this out. This next part, they didn't even realize they needed to change. As Jesus says in verse 17, look at that. He says, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. From their perspective, the Laodiceans thought they were doing great, right? They thought they were doing fantastic. In fact, here's the irony. Scholars say that the Laodicean church probably thought the reason they were so rich was because God was blessing them for how they were living. How ironic is that? We're doing so great, that's why we're doing so well. That's why we're never persecuted. That's why we make so much money in our business dealings. God must be blessing us. But Jesus tells them, no, you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. In other words, you think you're doing great, 
because you're living comfortable and you have all this money, but that's actually not what's happening here. It's actually quite the opposite, right? In fact, the only reason, Jesus says, that you are prospering is because you've been compromising with the culture around you. Of course you're making tons of money because you're disobeying how God says to do business. And the culture loves it when you disobey God, so of course you're making a ton. Of course you're comfortable because the culture persecutes real Christianity and you're not living out real Christianity. You're just laying back and going with the flow. So of course they're not going to persecute you. Of course you're comfortable. Understand, Laodicea, you're not having a good time because you're following God. You're actually having a good time because you're not following God. Whoa. The reason things were going so well for them was because they'd chosen friendship with the culture around them over faithfulness to God. And that was not something to be prideful about as they were apparently acting. We got it all together. So Jesus, if you notice, like we said, chips away at everything that they were prideful about one at a time. Here, look at this, right? And I assume he does that to get their hearts to a place where they'd actually listen, get them back to where they needed to be. And as he says, he's, okay, you guys think you have it all together, right? But in my side, you're wretched. You're pitiful. You think you're rich, but from my perspective, you're poor. You think you have this great eye medicine, but from God's perspective, the irony is you're completely blind. You think you have this great wool that everyone wants for clothing and stuff, but from God's perspective, you're as good as naked, right? In fact, if you kind of read between the lines there, it, it's, there's even this implication that this church is on the verge of being considered not even Christian, <laughs> right, because of the way they're living. Because the way they were living wasn't really any different from people outside the church in their culture. It's like, what even makes you different, right? So, Jesus says, and here's, what's his solution? He says, so, next there, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. What's he saying? In other words, Jesus goes to church, you need to stop trying to do this your way. And stop trying to be all about yourself and what you can bring to the table. And you need to make a major spiritual U-turn and come to me for the real stuff you need. Right? Right now. <laughs> Humbly, honestly, wholeheartedly, unreservedly, come back to Jesus. That was his solution. And go all in. You want true wealth, Jesus says here? You come to him for true wealth. Right? Like gold refined in the fire. I don't know if you know much about gold, but apparently that's a reference to this idea of gold with no impurities in it. Because you want the real good stuff, you only get that from me. You want true values that will guide your life. You quit compromising with the culture and make my values your values again. Yeah, but they might persecute me. He goes, that's just part of the deal. They don't get it. But you get it, and you need to stay faithful to me. You want to be truly clothed well? Man, ditch this ego and pride you got about what you can make. I have this wool. Look at me, blah. Because, man, forget what you can accomplish and what you have, and come to Jesus for his kind of white clothes to wear, he says, right? Purify your lives his way. Ditch the stuff that's out of bounds in God's sight. You want to see life clearly? Stop trusting in your own little medicine, and let Jesus show you how to see life like he sees it. Right, to open your eyes spiritually, to wake you up from blindness toward higher living. It's a lot of harsh words, but they needed this desperately because they thought everything was cool. And God goes, no, it's not. Let me help you get back on track. Basically, Jesus says, hey, just come back to me, church, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Anything less than 100% isn't the real thing. you got to be all in with him because he's everything you need in the first place. And notice, he wants you back. Right? Look at verse 19. He goes, hey, let me reassure you here. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Right? I'm not telling you this to make you just feel bad about yourself or just ruin your day. I'm telling you this because you are in a spiritual danger zone. Just like if you're about to eat some lukewarm food that's about to make you sick. I'm trying to stop you and go, hey, let me give you something better. You're in a spiritual danger zone. I'm trying to stop you before it gets worse and destroys you. I love you, so I'm trying to get you to change before it's too late, to stop being lukewarm and get that fire going again. So be earnest and repent, he says. I love that part in Greek, because it's literally this idea of set your heart on changing, which is the opposite of what they've been doing, right? They didn't set their heart on anything before. They were just kind of lukewarm, laid back, I don't care, half-hearted. She goes, let's fix this. Instead of acting like that, put, set your heart on this. Give it all you've got on repenting, this idea of making the U-turns, change the way you're thinking from the world's way to God's way. 
right? Change your way of looking at life to the way God looks at it. Get back that passion. Get back that uncompromising faithfulness for Jesus because he wants his church back. As he says in verse 20, look at that again. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. Two thoughts on that. First, notice Jesus doesn't force his way in. He goes, you got a choice. I love you. You need to change some stuff. I'm here for you, but you got to let me in. I'm not going to kick the door down. I just knock. Will you hear my voice and let me in? If so, I'll come in and eat with you. Now, that's a big deal in this culture, as some of you might know. Back then, to eat with someone implied an intimate relationship. So in verse 20, Jesus is reminding him, hey, as much as he didn't like the way they've been living, he's not throwing them away, okay? He'd much rather they repent and get back on track. He goes, I'm not rejecting you. I love you, man. And I'm here just knocking on your door. My power can strengthen your faith. I can get you out of this lukewarmness. And I'm still willing to have this close, personal, intimate relationship with you. But you gotta listen to my voice. Do what I'm telling you and let me back in. I used to work with a, a lady who was... Um, Greek in, in family. And in Greek, this word is aku, which is like where we get our word acoustic from, acoustic guitar. And so when Jesus goes, listen, it, it, it's what a dad would say to his kid if they're not listening, which some of you probably have much experience with. Like, listen, you know, in Greek they go, aku. That's what Jesus is saying. Yo, aku, listen. Will you listen to my voice? Come to me, renew your relationship with me, renew your commitment to me. He goes, and become that effective witness about me. Again, and if you will, look at what he says in verse 21. If, how awesome is this? Verse 21 says, To the one who is victorious, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Okay, if that part doesn't completely blow your mind, then read the next chapter later today, chapter 4, because it's a description of what God's throne room looks like. And there's just like no way you can read Revelation 4 see what an awesome picture that is, and realize what Jesus just offered you and come away from it going, okay. You know, it's just, it's mind-blowing. There is, it's a huge promise. Jesus says, I want you back, church. I love you. So verse 22, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <laughs> Which is really, again, as much of a challenge to us in America today as it was to them back then, isn't it? And I think God would have us take it as seriously as he wanted them to back then. You know, as a pastor, it's always like, okay, what do I talk about? So a couple weeks ago, I was like, well, what do you want to talk about? But, but seriously, in, in sermons and stuff, I'm always checking, praying, and praying with God, God, do you really want me to talk about this this week? And just over and over again, I felt like he was pushing me to this passage for today as part of this series. So what might he want us to get out of this? What part of this do we need to, to get in our own lives? So as we close up this morning, I want to challenge us to take some individual time to pray, like we do sometimes, just silently, just between you and God. I'll play softly on the guitar to hopefully drown out any street noise and stuff. And I want to challenge you to pray through three things. I actually got these from a pastor named Francis Chan. I thought they were really good. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to steal that, and here we go. You can do them too. Um, first, I want to challenge you to just ask God, is there anywhere in my life that I'm lukewarm spiritually? Is there? Don't be afraid. He loves you. He'll tell you because he loves you. Is there anywhere, any area of my life that I've been just doing the half-hearted Christianity thing, that you're not first and foremost, that it's not all about you? And if so, would you show me where that is? First prayer. Second prayer, challenge to pray. <laughs> if he shows you something, God, would you give me your strength to overcome that? Because he will. You know, we talked last time we met. Every Make every effort. His power is there to help you. God, would you help me get back on track with you in that area? Right, starting right here, right now, right? Resolve, starting right here, right now. God, what do I need to do? Help me get back on track. And then the third challenge, and this is the biggest, scariest one. <laughs> Can I challenge you to pray? God, would you do whatever it takes to get me passionate about you, like a Christian should be in your sight? Now, as we just saw with Laodicea, that's a scary prayer, right? Because everything you've been resting on that I'm so great, God might remove that, <laughs> okay? Anything you've been taking pride in, anything that's in between you and that complete faithfulness to him, he might go after it. And this prayer is saying, God, whatever it takes, if there's some relationship I need to let go of, take it out. If, if there's a job you need to take away, if it's my bank account, you know, whatever it is that's in the way between me and where you want me to be, God, would you do whatever it takes to remove that? It's a scary prayer. But I'll tell you one thing, it's not a prayer a lukewarm person would pray. So it's kind of step one to getting out of this. 
A lukewarm person would never ask that. So step one to getting out of lukewarmness, God, I'm done playing games. I gotta be passionate about you like you say. I'm going all in, Jesus. I want the real thing. Even if it looks nothing like what I thought it did before, make me the real thing. We do whatever it takes to get me passionate about you like you say I should be. So let's take some time with God this morning right now to pray through those things. I'll play softly on the guitar. And uh, just between you and him, just silently, and I'll close this up in about a minute or so. Don't watch the clock. Just take your time. Father God, I do pray. As, as a church, as your church, Jesus, first of all, thank you for loving us enough to tell us the truth. And we live in a culture of people who are afraid to do that. <laughs> I think we forget what it looks like sometimes. But thank you. You're not people. <laughs> You're our awesome God. Thank you for telling us what we need to hear, even when it's not what we want to hear. And Jesus, I do ask you, please, show us the areas where we've been lukewarm. Give us your strength to overcome it. And please do, I pray, whatever is necessary <laughs> to make us the church you want us to be. This year and for however long you want us to keep the doors open. Help us have a passion for you that's rooted in the truth, not just passion for passion's sake or just getting all whipped up for whatever reason, but Jesus, a passion that's based in the truth of who you are and what this is all about. Because we're not here to just play games or be some kind of social club. We're here to be your church and be all in with you. So we come to you again, Jesus, and invite you to come in again. SEC, to our families, to our lives. And Jesus, just take over. Be our Lord as well as our Savior. Be our boss. Help us resolve, Jesus, to be all in with you every day. Show us what it looks like. We thank you in your name.